my self-esteem has never been very good as I was growing up. My mother always told me how ugly I was. I can remember her telling me I was a very ugly child because I would pull my eyelashes out, and that was a nervous habit that came from the sexual abuse. Somewhere in the back of my little mind, I knew it was wrong. I didn't want to be there, so I would a lot of times turn off not only my sexual feelings, but that ended up pouring over into the rest of my life and learning, therefore, to turn off my feelings. I think the situation with my mom has been buried pretty deep. I think that the difficulty, and this is something that, that we uh, realized or Karn pointed out and, and is a definite you know, situation that that my mind was disconnected from my penis in the sense that that I I thought of sex as sex and it, it was very hard to get personal at the same time of, of having sex. The people you have just heard from are victims of incest, the most common form of child sexual abuse. Incest involves sexual activity between a child victim and a known family member. During incest, the sexual experiences are outside of the child's control, cloaked in secrecy, and often sensually overwhelming. Incest is not only a profound betrayal of human trust and protection, but it is a tragic loss of sexual innocence as well. As a result, incest can seriously harm the formation of healthy sexual attitudes, behaviors, and relationships. Welcome, my name is Wendy Maltz. I'm a psychotherapist, marriage counselor, and sex therapist who specializes in treating the sexual repercussions of incest. In this program, you will meet three couples who will share with you their stories about how incest has affected their intimate lives and what they have done to become active partners in healing. At the core of a couple's intimacy problems lies the trauma of the incest experience. For it was then that the victim first began associating sexual stimulation with negative emotional feelings. When I was being abused, I felt uh, very afraid, very scared. I would cry until I would um, not remember what was going on. Um, I felt also very loved by my father, but the love was very confusing because I didn't understand why he was doing this to me and why he would do that to me if he loved me so much. And I didn't feel like I had the power to be able to stop him. He was never physically um, overbearing. He never used any verbal language, he just did it. Child victims of incest feel confused and trapped. Even though the incest experience was upsetting and degrading, the physical sensations during incest may have been pleasurable at times, and in some instances, a child may have welcomed the affectionate attention that accompanied the contact. Unfortunately, due to this confusion, child victims may believe themselves in some way responsible for the abuse. Guilt-ridden, anxious about further sexual contact, and isolated from others, child victims live under tremendous psychological stress. To cope emotionally, they may divorce themselves from feelings and endure the abuse as an obligation. The primary abuser was my oldest brother. Um, it started with him when I was very, very young, um, again, probably in the six to seven range, I think, and went on until I was probably 12 years old, till I was old enough to know that what was going on was wrong and that it shouldn't be happening and that I needed to put a stop to it. Um, Mom and Dad would leave the house, and he'd take me into the bathroom and fondle, and I, um, I think he tried to 
have intercourse a couple times and that was unsuccessful. Um, he'd take me different places in the house sometimes and just do different stuff, but he made me do it. I never felt like I had a choice. Since a victim's role during incest is one of learned submission, boy victims may suffer much damage to their developing sense of manhood. To compensate, some will rationalize the abuse as something they wanted or were lucky to experience. Unaware of the humiliation they feel deep inside, boy victims may act sexually demanding or aggressive as they become older. Or they might become timid and insecure due to the sexually passive role they were forced into during the abuse. I was in a state of shock. I mean, I couldn't believe this was happening. I was just, you know, I mean, part of purely being caught that I was out in the garage, you know, jacking off was was bad enough to get caught, yet alone to, to have mom come in and, and start playing with me and, and actually rape me. And I... I'm sure it's just difficult because I've tried to block a lot of it out because it's, you know, part of, part of me didn't want it to be my mom. <laughs> it would have been easier if it was somebody else, some other lady. But being my mom, because I relate to her as my mom too, that somebody who raised me and took care of me and, you know, I guess that's the hardest part to deal with. Would their sexual innocence be trade? Both male and female incest survivors enter teenage dating relationships with a serious handicap. Some will withdraw from intimate relationships out of fear, while others may feel addictively compelled to go from one sexual conquest to another. Many survivors want to establish ongoing intimate relationships. However, without realizing it, they may be haunted by the past abuse. Incest survivors may have trouble distinguishing between appropriate and inappropriate sexual behavior. They may believe that sex is a condition for receiving love, and they may lack the ability to say no to sex. Ironically, it is often not until an incest survivor is established in an ongoing relationship that the sexual repercussions of incest surface and become apparent. The symptoms of sexual intimacy problems include avoiding or being afraid of sex, approaching sex as an obligation, difficulty becoming aroused and feeling sensation, negative feelings such as fear, anger, or disgust with touching, feeling emotionally distant or not present during sex, engaging in compulsive or inappropriate sexual activity painful intercourse and orgasmic difficulty for women, erectile difficulty and lack of ejaculatory control for men. The emergence of intimacy problems is extremely upsetting, given that the rest of the relationship may be going quite well. Dale and Nancy were high school sweethearts. Currently, they have been married for seven years. Nancy's older brother repeatedly forced her into sexual contact from age six to 11 years old. It wasn't until one tearful night several years ago that Dale and Nancy admitted there was a serious problem in their sexual relationship. This experience prompted them to enter therapy. Our sex life definitely changed from the day we got married, which was a surprise to me. Because we'd been having sex about once a week up until the last couple months till we got married. And all of a sudden it was like, you know, I had to be really forceful during the honeymoon. Come on, dear. <laughs> and uh, she was real cold, not very receptive at all. I didn't know why. I didn't know why. It was frustrating for me. It was frustrating for him. And, you know, we'd go, we'd go two months without making love. And then it would, the only reason I'd, I'd give in at that point is because I thought he was going to leave me. That, okay, I've gone just about as far as I can go. As long as I can go now, I better give in and do this now. I really wasn't quite sure what the problem was. I, for a long time, I 
just couldn't really grasp it at all. And then I started laying these guilt trips on myself, like, you're a brute, you want sex all the time, you just pester, you know, you're you're sick yourself almost. So I, I just more of a less did a old knife myself type routine for a, a lack of knowing anything else. I couldn't figure it out exactly what it was. We didn't know how to talk about it. You know, everything else is wonderful. We have great friends. We like the same kinds of things. And and this was the only area in our lives where there was a major problem. And that was frustrating, too, because it's a major one, and it's real scary. Teresa and Tom have been married for eight years and have four children. In her childhood, from age 3 to 11, Teresa was subjected to continual sexual contact with both her father and her older brother. Several years ago, Teresa attended group therapy for incest survivors and then was referred for couples sex therapy. For Teresa and Tom, the early recognition of their problem was wrought with depression and much frustration. When we first got married, everything was really good as far as our sex department went. Um, we got aroused very easily, both of us. Now, once I realized that he loved me, no matter what I did, then those sexual feelings started to drop off and I didn't have to use my body anymore to make him love me. He loved me no matter what. It was just hard for me to go to bed and just lay there with my wife and not have anything happen whatsoever. Usually she would just turn over and go to sleep. So I think sometimes, well, at times out of frustration that I would just, I would just touch her until I got some kind of reaction, whether it be negative or whatever, just to, I don't know, feel like I was with somebody. I just try to take it a day at a time. And uh, I just really didn't know what to do. I just kept trying and trying and talking. And, but to her, I think it seemed like I was just complaining. And, uh, but it was from the fact that we didn't understand what the problem was. I pretended for a long time that everything was just the same. I faked my way through it for probably up to a year or maybe longer before we decided that there was a definite problem. Roger and Karn have been married for 12 years and have two children. As a child, Roger was subjected to ongoing experiences of sexual embarrassment and humiliation by his mother. Then, when he was 15 years old, she raped him. In the early years of their relationship, Karn liked the fact that Roger was not as sexually demanding as other men. However, as time went on, she began to wonder why the sexual aspect of their relationship was not progressing. After attending incest support groups, they decided only several months ago to begin addressing sexual concerns in private therapy as well. For Roger, the abuse affected his male role development, making it difficult for him to feel confident in initiating sexual interactions. I was very hesitant. I was very withdrawn still, kind of always had to have complete approval almost. You know, I just, with any kind of of hesitations or something, I would start withdrawing back. I would have, you know, it was very hard for me to, to constantly have the initiative to, to move forward on a, you know, just a, a situation of being together, you know, in bed and stuff. And uh, I think a lot of it came around, you know, some of it was just the fact that I was scared to death of, of sex, but at the same time, I really wanted it too when we actually would get to where we'd be making love his heart would palpitate you know everything would not flow easy it would just be real scared and rigid and um, then he would ejaculate real quick and it was over and we were both frustrated and um, not a lot of understanding back in those days so there was a lot of anger and fights and 
people going around for two or three days being really angry at each other and not knowing why. And it was really um, two or three years after our daughter was born that I began to question why his behavior was the way it was. And I'd never really experienced a relationship for this long period of time that was so non-sexual and non-personal. And so he kind of divulged and began slowly over the years, I think maybe a couple of years, sharing with me what had happened. Since incest creates a crisis in intimacy for both people in the relationship, it can be very beneficial if the couple work as a team in addressing the sexual effects of incest. Attending counseling sessions together helps the survivor feel emotionally supported and helps the partner feel actively involved. When she was going to group therapy by herself, she'd come home and tell me, you know, what was going on. And uh, she seemed uh, pretty enthused about it, but I wasn't a part of it, so it really, it really didn't have a whole lot of meaning to me. It's kind of like secondhand news. But when we started going together, it made a lot of difference because then we could uh, understand each other's, you know, feelings and see what really was going on with each other. Before, when Nancy was seeing another counselor, I felt like we were getting nowhere because it was just, I wasn't aware of what was going on at the counseling and I wanted to know where's this going, what's happening. And being able to sit in and, and actually having an active part and, and even being very useful at times with information that either she had forgotten or wasn't even aware of, I think it really helped since it is a problem f with both of us that both of us be there and attend in the counseling. In counseling, both the partner and the survivor learn that the incest experience has left lasting negative associations that infringe upon present-day sexual touch. Unconsciously, the incest survivor associates the present-day partner with the offender of the past. It wasn't that Dale was my brother, it was that Dale wanted sex, and that meant control, and that meant I didn't have a choice, it meant I had to do it. That was the association. It wasn't Dale personally but it was the associations that went along with, with sex. If Tom would take my hand and just rub it with his thumb, immediately I felt like my dad was rubbing my hand and I would not want him to do it. I would have to push his hand away. Um, I could be laying in bed at night and he would have his foot on my foot and I would immediately think of my dad um, and I would have to push him away and he would feel rejected again. To be associated with an offender by your wife, it just makes you feel kind of nauseous, and you just really can't believe that it's happening. It, uh, it just almost, well, uh, both part, you know, people, the husband and wife are both victims, it turns out to be. An important yet often difficult step in the healing process is for the incest survivor to share in detail what went on during incest encounters. This information helps the partner to identify and avoid specific activities that might trigger flashbacks to the abuse. In listening to these descriptions, the partner realizes how very awful the incest must have been, and as a result, may develop feelings of despair and anger towards the offender it can be especially upsetting when the offender is someone who is currently involved in the couple's family life, such as a father-in-law. It was just kind of strange. He'd come over and it, it was like nothing happened, but here we were living, going through hell at the same time. And it was, that was hard to deal with. I mean, because I was wondering, you know, should I hate him or what? But it, it really wouldn't do any good. But it was just all those kind of things. It was just even more confusing because it was just like, you know, treat, she was a victim of her father, and then here he is coming over and visiting, you know, like nothing had ever happened. The oldest brother really did have a, he was the major effect on our life, and I was very angry with him. It just... I was ready to go up to his house and, and clean him out, you know, clean
clean his clock. And uh, I, I guess that was the first initial gut reaction. When he first disclosed to me that it was his mother, I was stunned, shocked. Um, I felt really sorry for him. And I was really angry at her. I was, the anger built of, over weeks and I found myself just livid. You know, it was all of a sudden, my God, she crossed that line, your mother, this person I know and like, did this to you. And then I guess I kind of did victim stuff. How dare she do this? And now I'm suffering for it. You know, we're suffering for it. Look what we've gone through over the last how many years because of her. It can be beneficial when survivors reach a point where they no longer feel intimidated by the offender. One way of accomplishing this is for the survivor to talk with the offender about the incest as one adult to another. I didn't want to be superficial anymore. I couldn't just cover it over. If I had to talk to my mom and continue talking to her, I had to get a lot of stuff off my chest. And so uh, I pulled all the bones out of the closet and uh, I talked to my mom for three, three and a half, three, three, three and a half hours and uh, talked about a lot of things and uh, she apologized, you know, I thanked her for it. I, you know, I told her how screwed up it's done, what it's done to me. The goal of this type of confrontation is for the survivor to reclaim power and if possible, learn information that may be of help in resolving feelings from the abuse. Direct confrontation is not always advisable or possible, and the results are rarely 100% positive. Shortly following her brave talk with him about the abuse, Teresa was disowned by her father. When I did confront him, Tom was right there with me. He was not sitting next to me. He was. Um, we were at a park, and he was just at another picnic table with the children. Um, he was ready to support me in anything that I needed him to be there for, whether it was for physical reasons or mental reasons or if I needed to just get up and leave. He was right there to support me. I wrote out... Um, everything I wanted to say so I wouldn't forget anything that I wanted to say or add anything that I didn't want to say and regret later. I wrote it all down and um, I said it all to him. I made him sit there and listen to me until I was completely finished. He tried to stop me three or four times and make it sound as if it wasn't as bad as it really was. I let him know that it was a problem even though he told me it wasn't. And I felt like I had the power to beat him with it now, instead of having him have the power over me. I had the power over him. Working together to resolve feelings from the incest builds trust, improves communication, and helps bond the couple emotionally. As a team, they can start addressing sexual intimacy problems by first stopping old patterns of sexual relating that had been triggering feelings from the abuse. These changes can be anything from an outright ban on any direct sexual contact to an agreement that there will be no touch of any kind unless initiated by the survivor. Just knowing that, that I didn't have that obligation, it was an obligation that I didn't have to have sex, I didn't have to take care of him. He was taking care of himself for a while and, and that, that took a load off my mind and allowed me to relax a little better without having that added outside tension of, oh, he's probably going to want this now. What am I going to do? I really don't want to do this. And having to go through the same thing I'd been doing, the fake. It gave me a sense of relief to have him not touching me in any way, shape, or form. <clears throat> I felt like uh, I didn't have to be defensive. All the pressure was gone. I kind of thought, well, this was e this was going to be easy, 
because I knew what to do or what not to do in this case. And uh, I was, uh, in a way, kind of excited about it because uh, it seemed to me that there might be a, a positive outcome. And uh, inside, deep inside, I think I really knew that that was uh, the best thing to do at the time. It took a matter of two weeks, and I started longing for him to touch me without even knowing it, that that's what I was doing. I'd start dreaming about him. Um, I'd wake up feeling like I wanted to be sexually active with him. Although I didn't want to integrate that, I felt that way. Um, it went on for a while, and it was, it was very hard for Tom not to be able to touch me. But in time, I have come to feel like I can be relaxed around him, and I can have natural affections for him during the day that aren't forced and that I know I don't have to, that he's not expecting anything in return. These changes present a continual challenge for the partner. It is difficult to remain for a long time desiring and yet unable to engage in sexual relations with the person one loves. Partners may begin to doubt their sexual attractiveness and abilities and they may begin to fear for the future of their relationships. I found that I went through different stages of, of myself as the counseling went on. There were periods of time that I really doubted if we were going to be an item, we were going to be together. Um, dealing with the, the frustration that this person that I care and love very much, I couldn't have and there was no sexual relating, relating between us for the longest time. Um, I had moments where I thought I was going to grab some pretty little co-ed and fly off somewhere and have a fling. But I, then I'd think about, I just couldn't do that to this person over here. I'm just, I'm not that kind of a guy that I can do that. It just, it's not in me. I knew there was so much between the two of us that was positive and good that I just couldn't let this sexual problem between us be something to pull us apart. With old negative patterns of behavior out of the way, the couple can begin a series of progressive touch exercises at home. These include individual adaptations of sensate focus exercises commonly used in sex therapy. With these techniques, touch can be relearned as something positive, undemanding and nurturing. There was just to be a light touch, um, not really sexual, just kind of getting familiar with the entire body from head to toe, running fingers through the hair and... Excluding the excluding, sexual parts. Excluding uh, sexual organs, of course, and just kind of having a new awareness of your partner's body. And we tried that for a while, but Nancy was very uncomfortable, so we were told it was all right to modify these exercises to whatever fit our needs, our situation. So we tried it with clothing on, and we did that for a while until it, it became awkward. It and got we, funny. Yeah, and it we became progressed. Humorous. We progressed then, actually, to the first stage where we, we were doing it nude. It was very scary at first and it was hard for me to get rid of those negative feelings or put them aside and start feeling the good feelings that were coming up. We both expressed fear, you know, right off the bat. I mean, laying there naked on the bed and just looking down at her saying, I'm scared. <laughs> and and. I don't know really what I'm doing, but we'll just kind of, we'll do it what we, what feels right. And, and it, you know, felt all right. But being, but being able to say I'm scared to start with and I'm not trying to hurt you, but I might, I don't want to, there's all these little fears in there that, that come up. And uh, I think just being out and open that we're both 
you know, ready to learn. Um, he would rub me, um, rub my nipples, um, finally would go down to the genital area and just look and see and feel and we'd talk. And it was kind of interesting that we both were telling each other about ourselves. Being able to stimulate and to feel and to explore gives you a more understanding. You know, and, and for me, I guess it's uh, it releases, it, it helps me with a lot of the fears that were built up over the years of, of feel like I was fumbling in the dark for so long and now I feel like I'm opening the door and, and, and learning something rather than uh, dealing with my own fantasies and, and fumbling. What I find nice is that he can be touching me and doing that, and, I, and he's relaxed. It's not the old patterns which set up all those negative dynamics, and that we're actually just starting a whole new way of being, a whole new life. It's all a new program. So it's, it's much more comfortable for me to lay there. And even if he is... Um, anxious or, or feeling that way, he'll tell me. And so there we, it's in the open, it's okay, it's not stuffed, the anger doesn't build, um, we're talking, we're usually laughing. We learned a lot of body communication through that, and we felt like we were getting to know each other's bodies all over again in a safe manner instead of in an abusive manner. It helped us to feel comfortable being around each other um, in all parts of our life, not just in the bedroom. Um, it also rubbed off onto the children. We feel more comfortable around the kids just giving each other a kiss at night or any time in the daytime. Feel more comfortable overall. In time, the home exercises can include genital stimulation for the purpose of increasing pleasurable sensations. In addition, the couple can address sexual functioning problems such as lack of orgasm, vaginal pain, and erectile or ejaculatory trouble. Another step in the healing process might include exercises in which vaginal penetration is undertaken in a relaxed and gentle manner. Eventually, the time comes for sexual relations to be reestablished. It is up to the survivor to initiate and control the intimate sexual contact. I was afraid that, that if we were to go ahead and, and start doing the intercourse and the lovemaking now that he would have all these expectations. Oh boy, now we've done it. It's everything's we're going to live happily ever after. Hollywood. <laughs> and, and so in that way it was a little bit scary, but I... I felt good. I got really excited one day for whatever reasons and and it was just right and so I made my move and we talked about it a little bit and and we went to bed and had wonderful love making. <laughs> and it was pretty interesting that it was after that had happened um, we were kind of laying there talking, and all of a sudden, again, I just burst out bawling again. Totally unexpected. Poor Dale thought he broke me again. Wrong. He oh, thought wrong. something had happened, but it was just such an emotional release. As time goes on, the couple develops new patterns for having ongoing sexual relations. Communication skills are learned so they can both comfortably initiate and decline sexual advances. I tend to be... Um, sexually aroused very easily and most of the time Nancy basically has to just walk across the room <laughs> and I learned that she wasn't and that we need if I was interested in having sex making love that we need to go through a systematic um, preparation for it sit down and do some talking and find out where each other is rather than just, you know, down the hall, let's go, it's, it's time. And I think that really brought an awareness to us and that it's okay to stop in the middle of it if there's a problem, if all of a sudden one partner 
feels like this isn't right, I'm getting really uptight, that it's okay to say, all right. Communication, basic Just talking. communication. One thing that we've found that's worked really good for us is talking first and then continuing if that's what you decide to do. Um, I've found that that's worked really good for me. Um, there's, in the past years, trying to work this stuff out, there's been a lot of underlying current going on. Um, you know, if he comes up and gives me a hug, that means we have to go hit the sack. So we don't do that anymore because that was a negative given. So if he comes up and gives me a hug now, he says, I'm just giving you a hug because I want to give you a hug. Is that okay? And I'll say yes or no. And it's just a basic communication. I have a choice. He has a choice. We both have to be in for it and ready for sex if that's what we want to do. It can take many months, sometimes years, to develop a new, mutually satisfying sexual relationship. Sex takes on a new meaning, no longer associated with abuse. Sexual relations can be experienced as positive sharing times together. As the process of healing continues, victims emerge survivors, reclaiming their sexuality as something for themselves. And together with their partners, they develop stronger, more mature relationships. To allow myself to become sexually aroused has been a wonderful learning experience. Um, it's been a difficult one. I've been turning myself off for years. Um, it's still difficult for me um, I'm learning to deal with those feelings and and you know the minute it starts coming up not to immediately turn it off like I used to but let those feelings grow and 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 become sexual and then knowing that I have a choice for me it's before I felt like when we were having sex that she wasn't with me she was elsewhere just to, to see her face her attitude it was uh, you know ho-hum it was off staring at the wall somewhere not really being involved with the act and now there's participation it's exciting sex is really wonderful now Right. We wanna we wanna find out what normal's gonna be for us now. That hasn't yet been established. We're we're on an even kill, we've learned the skills, now we need to practice them and figure out what the norm is gonna be for us. I've had to learn that a husband kisses his wife more than once a day and it is okay. I've had to learn that a husband wants to just reach out and touch their spouse that he just wants to be able to touch her and love her, that he doesn't expect sexual relations just because he wants to touch her. My outlooks on sex and marriage has definitely changed because it has, uh, it doesn't take as much importance as, say, our communication or just our relationship as a couple, as husband and wife. It, uh, it's nice, but if it's not right, it's, it has no meaning. In other words, if it's not right, it's, you're better off, we're better off not having sex. Uh, we've grown more lately in just our, our personal relationship. And that means more, it means more to me, and I think us now than anything else. I'm surprised at how much my eyes water up more when I little things start getting to me. You know, where before I was so controlled and so, you know, nothing could penetrate me that that you can only you can only receive those good feelings if you leave yourself vulnerable to possibly getting hurt too, but you know, you don't know unless you you open yourself up to those feelings and uh, if you both open up I think that that they're more positive than than negative because you're sharing them you know you're working together on things old meaning of sex with Roger in our relationship 
for all those years meant frustration and sadness, grief, confusion, anger, um, not wanting to initiate it because you knew what you'd be getting into, pain. Um, <clears throat> new meaning of sex now, it's just almost like it's, I don't know what to expect, but I know it's going to be good because there's such a sense of commitment and uh, we're, we're learning more about each other and we're, um, we're friends, we're really friends now. It's We've really always exciting. been friends, now we're trying to just be <laughs> sexual partners. Because <laughs> yeah. I think that's what, what has kept us together a lot too, is that we have been good friends. It's just that now we're trying to become more of a sexual partners to Our each other. Our friendship has more meaning now.